Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jill Tyne Nissenbaum. She's with the Physical Therapy Program here in the School of Medicine and Public Health. She's going to be speaking with us about physical therapy management of osteoarthritis in the hip and knee. I'm going to ask her to approach the lectern. Yay. Drum roll. Yeah. Thank you. I'm now going to ask her the five questions, which she has never, ever, ever known about coming. Where were you born? I was born in Carroll, Iowa. How Western. many R's and how many L's? Two you? R's, two L's. It's named after James R. Carroll who did something famous, I'm not sure what it was. I think he was probably for the, uh, those study carols thing. He probably <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, there's not a lot of studying that goes on in Carroll, Iowa, unfortunately. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. And where'd you go to high school? I went to Carroll Kemper High School. It was, we had a town of 10,000. We had two high schools. Um, Carroll Kemper was the parochial school. And my high school class had about 250 students in it. The public school at the, the same year had a class of less than 100. So I grew up with a very warped sense of reality of what kind of a normal kind of demographic, if you will, was. And now you live in <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. And now I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I went to Iowa State University, home of the Cyclones, go Cyclones. Yeah. It was 65 miles down the road from my hometown and being a first generation college individual, my parents said, there's a college down there, go to that one. And so my siblings and I all have our first degree from there. Um, my brother went on to become an accountant. My sister has her PhD, I have a DSC. So. I feel like our parents did right by us by showing us the value of an education which they unfortunately could not have. Um, my undergraduate degree is in physical education with an emphasis in athletic training. There was not a major in athletic training at the time, but I took the required courses and did the required hours to become a certified athletic trainer upon graduation. Way to go. Thank you. And where'd you go for your advanced degrees? What are they? Because you mentioned a DSC, which yep. is different than what I'm used to hearing. Correct. So and where did you get it? I went to, then I went to the arch rival, the University of Iowa, down the road, down Interstate 80. There's a, there's a university in Iowa City? Oh, well, that's what they say. <laughs> there was a basketball team until a couple weeks ago. No. Um, ouch. No. Oh, somebody um, call 911. We have a burn in <laughs> Um, so I went to the University of Iowa and I got my master's in physical therapy. At the time, there were only two physical therapy schools in the state of Iowa. Iowa State still doesn't have one to this day. They're primarily an agricultural engineering type of school. Um, so Iowa had more of the medical things. So I went to the University of Iowa to get my master's in physical therapy and I got that in 1993. Then I came here and after I was here for quite some time, I decided I wanted a terminal degree and I got a doctorate of clinical science, which is basically a, a clinical PhD. Um, it's fairly common in the physical therapy world. It's not that common outside of it, but I did go to Rocky Mountain University in Provo, Utah um, in a hybrid model where I was a full-time student there, but I was still full-time working here. So I did an immersion for a week, came home, studied a bunch, back and forth, back and forth, and I did all my research here. And I finished that in 2010. You had to fly back and forth to Provo? I had to fly back and forth to Provo eight times. So, yeah. It could go to worse places. It was beautiful. I know. It was nice. Yeah. All right, I'm never going to ask these questions again of you because <laughs> I'm feeling really inadequate. Ooh, and I lo is that knitting or crocheting? That's knitting. knitting. Yeah, I'm a crocheter, so we can't be friends. <laughs> okay. Stitch and bitch? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's what, I have a group of friends and that's what they do and that's what they call it. Sorry. We'll be heavily, heavily editing this one. Sorry. All right, no, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's wonderful. I'm never going to be asked back again. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the University of Iowa? No, I'm good. Okay. Well, my pleasure to, again, to... Five? Yeah. Oh. Oh, when did you come here? You already mentioned that. Though. Well, I came here in 1994, right yeah, after yeah. I graduated from, from Iowa um, for my first job. I did an internship here, and I truly fell in love with Madison. And I came here for my first job, and I 
Thought I'd stay a couple of years, and that was 1994, and here I am. I know the feeling. My sister's also a physical therapist and an athletic trainer, and she's here in town as well, too. And so yeah. it's it's nice to have a, a sibling in and town. the two of you do Larry Mueller show from time My to time? My sister and I do the Larry Mueller show the third Monday of the month. Third Monday of the month from 11 to 1230. We just did it last Monday, so tune in sometime. Larry's great. Yep, the so. finest. Please join me in welcoming Jill Tyne Nissenbaum to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't even said anything yet, and you're already applauding. You guys are great. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you to everyone for coming and including me on this talk. I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, I, I love talking about physical therapy and the, um, the uh, things that we can provide to the public. Um, as physical therapists, and this fits so nicely in line with the Larry Mueller show that my sister and I do. I feel like this is a service to the state of Wisconsin and really beyond to offer this type of education and kind of help people um, on their life journey. We want people to stay healthy for a long time. As I typically tell people, patients, when I'm done with them, no offense, but I hope I never see you again. Because my job as a physical therapist is to educate you and teach you how to manage your condition. And so um, that's usually my line. I'll say, you can stop in the clinic and say hi to me. I'd love that, but I hope I don't see you again for this condition. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on. That's where I'm from, that state. I'm going to do a little shameless plug. Um, one of the things that my sister and brother and I love to do, they're both older than I am. My brother is 64. Six, my, my brother's 66, my sister's 64, and I am 55. So the one passion the three of us have had for many, many years is biking. And from a rag bri, from a joint perspective, it is one of the best things you can do for your lower extremity joints. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. So my sister and brother and I foolishly ride our bike 500 and some miles across the state of Iowa annually. So. Um, this is a picture from RAGBRAI, the Register's annual great bike ride across Iowa. And we ride our bike across the state every year. Here's a picture of my sister and myself on RAGBRAI one year. And I'm standing next to one of my PT classmates from the University of Iowa. We stayed with his parents on RAGBRAI. And my sister wrote a textbook. And so as a, as a gift for staying overnight, here's a textbook. Enjoy this. And so she hands out her textbooks as we go across the state. Um, this is my... On, my, on the left is my nephew, and standing right next to me in the orange is my brother um, and a friend of his. They all do rag bri with us. This was actually a bike ride we did in Coachella in California for my 50th birthday. So have bike, will travel. So it's, it's a kind of a reason that we get together and socialize, and part of that is we like to do some sort of exercise when we get together. All right, so moving on. I don't know why I'm click, click. Oh, here, maybe I should just hit. There we go. So my main job or the main patient population I work with um, in the athletic department is UW athletes. So I have um, a closed clinic, if you will. I don't see patients outside of UW athletes. Um, so th this is the population and the demographic I always work with. And individuals say, well, they don't have bad joints, do they? They don't have arthritis, do they? And unfortunately, they do. So some of them do have early onset arthritis. Um, the things I think you have to consider is they put a lot of load through their joints, right? They go in crazy positions. They are hockey goalies. Think about the amount of motion that they need at their hips and knees to block a puck. Um, our kickers who have all sorts of wonky movements, if you will, our volleyball players who land on their knees and are torquing and twisting. All of these athletes put a lot of load and demand through their knees. And one of the things that's really important to me is I spend a lot of time educating them on once this party is over, once these four years are over, how are you going to manage these joints for the rest of your life? That's really important. So you've had a designed exercise program put in front of you for four years. When you graduate, you have to figure out how you're going to take care of these joints by yourself. So that's one of my big motivations and one thing I spend a fair amount of time doing with our athletes as they kind of do their exit process for us. So let's talk a little bit about osteoarthritis. It is the most common form of arthritis. So OA, osteoarthritis, is kind of the garden variety arthritis, if you will. It is the leading cause of disability. It's more disability among older adults than cancer, than anything else. It is number one because it affects 
so many people. Um, primary places we see OA, typically we think about the weight-bearing joints, so the hips and the knees. People often ask, well, gosh, the ankle is a weight-bearing joint. It bears as much weight, weight as the hip and the knee. Why don't we see OA at the ankle? Anybody have an idea why? The way it's designed. That's exactly right. It is a very tight congruent joint. It is a mortise joint. And because it doesn't have as much mobility, so all those wonky little things you get are movements are a culmination of a whole bunch of different joints down there, we don't see a lot of OA at the ankle, unless you've experienced some sort of trauma. So if you've had an ankle fracture or something like that, you may be more predisposed to osteoarthritis at your ankle. But as a general rule, we don't see it there very much. The reason we see it at the hip and the knee the knee is between the two longest levers in the body. Okay, these are your two longest bones, your femur and your tibia. And alignment becomes very important with this. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, at the hip, your hip is a pretty congruent joint and does a lot of compression and, in essence, a lot of grinding. So between those two joints, we have a tendency to see more OA than we do at the ankle. Now, we also see osteoarthritis in the hand, which most people don't weight bear in their hands, okay? Gymnasts, things like that do. But we see osteoarthritis in people's hands as you're sitting there and knitting. So do you have any osteoarthritis in your thumb by chance? Oh, yes. Oh, you do, okay. So the thumb is the other most common place that people get OA, and it's at what we, the base of the thumb so 70% of your hand function comes from your thumb. And so there's a joint down here that gets a ton of use. It's called your carpometacarpal joint, saddle joint. And so we will see a lot of people who get osteoarthritis of their thumb, especially people who do a lot of fine dexterity that use their hands frequently throughout the day. So you're shaking your head, yes. You're knitting, and what are you making me? I'm making a pair of socks. You're making a pair of socks, OK. And you do have some arthritis in your, in your Basilar arthritis or basilar arthritis, both hands? Yes. Okay. Which, what's your dominant hand, right or left? Right. Okay, right-handed. Is it worse in your right hand? No. Okay, so pretty even. Um, what do you do to manage it? Feet, warmth, massage. Okay, rest. great. Okay. Do you wear nights? Do you wear splints? Not usually. When it's really bad, I do, but... There we go. Usually. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about some interventions we can do. There's interventions that actually work, you'd think they'd work at every joint the same, and some that are better in the upper extremity and some that are better in the lower extremity. So we'll talk about those. So what happens when I get this osteoarthritis? And what happens is the whole joint is involved, and it really starts with this degradation of your articular cartilage. And articular cartilage, I am telling you, my friends, it is the most important stuff. Um, it is avascular and aneural. We have nothing to replicate it. Like that you can't go to like a articular cartilage store and buy, buy more articular cartilage. There's no um, production of it. They're trying to simulate it in labs, things like that. Nothing works as well. So pure articular cartilage, so my articular cartilage, my joints are together. If I have pristine articular cartilage and my joints move, they have less friction than ice on ice. If you take an ice cube and throw it down an ice pond, your articular cartilage, when healthy, has less friction. That sounds delightful, right? I would like, I would like nice, nice lubrication in my joints. What happens is as we age or if we experience a trauma, we get a divot or we get some degradation or wear and tear of our articular cartilage. And the analogy I use with people, and most people can visualize this, there's, there's two analogies I use. First of all, the hard-boiled egg. And when you take the peel off, you know sometimes how you take a little divot of egg off with it? It's exactly what happens to your articular cartilage. You take a little divot off with it, and then it starts spreading and growing and getting worse. Likewise, the other analogy I give people is when you're driving down University Avenue and there's a pothole, right? There's a divot in the, in, the, in the cement. That is what happens to your articular cartilage. Now, what do the road crews do come spring when they see those potholes? What do they fill them in with? 
asphalt. They fill, they fill them in with a sub, not as good, not as perfect uh, device, right? Right. So there are actual surgical techniques that do the exact same thing. Okay. We're not going to talk about those tonight, but you can have those potholes filled in with a kind of second tier uh, material. It's pretty hard to fill it in with the first tier material because you just don't have enough. But what happens is you start getting this inflammatory process. Your joint gets angry. Um, all of your joints are in a balloon of uh, a synovial filled balloon. It's got fluid in it. That fluid can become inflamed, warm, hot. When that inflammation occurs in that balloon, the inflammation starts becoming a little Pac-Man and eating at your articular cartilage more. So when people say, oh, I have a little swelling in my joint, it's no big deal, I say back, actually, it, it is a big deal. To, to carry that chronic inflammation in your joint, it's just kind of eating away at your articular cartilage. You really don't want that. You need to do something to get that under control. I have a lot of people that dismiss it, and that's just, that's just not good. So do a lot of people have OA? Sure do. So it's more common in females, and it's more common in individuals who are obese or overweight. You can see some percentages there. And here's an interesting fact. I like to give people who need a little motivation to lose some weight. So a 10% weight reduction in your body weight will, with severe obesity actually results in about a 50% reduction in the risk of osteoarthritis. So if, if they haven't experienced that downward spiral yet, it's like, you know what, if you get this weight off, if you do something to make some lifestyle changes, you could actually reduce your risk of OA, which for a lot of people is good motivation. Um, it's more common in physically inactive people. So people who are active still have some OA, but it's more common in people who are inactive. And think about all the positive things these people who are physically active are doing to help their bodies. So you'll hear people say, oh, I got a little wear and tear arthritis, but you know what, I keep going. And, and that's a really good thing because there's so many systemic benefits of being physically active. So if you think about the reduction in, in diabetes, you think about the reduction in high blood pressure, um, you think about the strength that comes with this. So you got a little arthritis, but you know what? It's okay to maintain physical activity. I don't want people to shy away from it. What's important is that you do the right physical activity. So what's right for me may not be right for you, and that's where seeing a physical therapist comes in. I can't just make this blanket statement, hey, y'all got to exercise and strength train. I can't say that, okay? That's where it becomes so important to see a physical therapist. You have some arthritis, that's fine. We can work around that. We want you to stay physically active. We want you to maintain your weight. We want you to maintain overall health and well-being. It's really important. The other thing we know is that people with osteoarthritis have a poor health-related quality of life. Um, they have uh, for fair or poor health at a much higher prevalence. They have more unhealthy days. They have more mentally unhealthy days. And this is really important, especially when we're, I mean, I'd like to think that COVID is in our rear view mirror, but let's be realistic, it's probably not. So we need things to, to get out and exercise and be mentally well, okay? These are days on an annual basis? Yes, these are days, I believe, on an annual basis. Um, days activity is limited. That's a really good question. It might be monthly, but I think it's annually. I'd have to check. And. Quality of life is very impaired in individuals who have less than a high school education. They've been unemployed for greater than a year. They're physically inactive and they currently smoke. So there's this lifestyle that can kind of lead into this and it leads into poor quality of life. So we gotta somehow try and break that cycle for people. It's, it's, it's really important. Okay, so what about obesity? So people are saying, oh, obesity is the reason you have osteoarthritis. That's this, the two just to go hand in hand. Not necessarily. So mechanical loading in and of itself can't explain arthritis. If you think about a runner, lifelong runners, they probably load their joints more than somebody who's a little overweight, right? Throughout their lifetime, they're putting a lot of load through their joints. Think about those marathoners, people out there, okay? But they don't have a higher risk of osteoarthritis. Maybe people who have faulty alignment who are runners kind of self-select and discontinue that activity. I don't know. Maybe the people who are lifelong runners are people who have good congruent joints, things like that. There's always argument about this. 
The other thing is obesity increases the risk of osteoarthritis in a non-weight-bearing joint. So obesity will increase your risk of OA in the hand. You're not weight-bearing through your hand. So the whole business with osteoarthritis is not loading just itself. It's all these interactions of pathological changes in the biomechanical and physiologic factors at multiple levels. There are people who feel very strongly, and I'm really curious about the person who's coming in to talk about diet. There are, very, there are a lot of people looking into the inflammatory diet. Eating an inflammatory diet can contribute to your pain that you see with osteoarthritis. So things like that are being looked at. So it's not just loading itself. We can't just say, oh, you've loaded a bunch, there you go. So things we consider are too much load if we can control it, so muscle weakness. So if I am weak in my muscles, when I load, there's more load going through the joint than there is through the muscles. So a good strength training program can decrease the amount of load going through your knee joint by 70%. So hit the weights, people. It's really important, OK? And the other problem is if you have some sort of structural malalignment. So I'm confident you've all seen people who stand with their knees a little knocked this way. Or as I like to say, all cowboyed up, so like riding a horse. And that load is not evenly distributed. So if I take a load and I put it through a smaller area, force increases, right? So we need to make sure that the load is evenly distributed. Other things can be if, you had a, if you've experienced a traumatic event at that uh, joint. So things we think about are people who have torn their ACL. Anybody in here have an ACL tear? Yeah? How long ago? Uh, probably a year. Uh, two years ago you tore your ACL? Were you managed surgically or conservatively? Conservatively. You're conservatively, okay, good for you. So the downside of ACL tears, and for those of you who've been watching March Madness, probably saw a couple injuries that were questionable ACL tears. Um, we know for a fact that 10 years after you tear your ACL, regardless of whether you've had surgery or not, on not necessarily a clinical presentation, but on plain radiographs, you have osteoarthritis. So do you know what the um, most prevalent age demographic is for a female to tear her ACL? You know what that window is? That four-year window? 14 to 18. Right? My knees were fine then. So here we have high school girls who by age 24 will have radiographic changes in their knees. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. Okay, and then last but not least, it's always, oh, you can just blame your parents, right? So connective tissue is inherited. There's no doubt about it. So did you get Kmart retreads or Goodyear super radials? Like how did, how, what, kind of, what, what kind of quality of connective tissue do you have? And you'll hear this, oh, my dad had back surgery and I had back surgery. Probably a connective tissue thing. Or I had a student who had... He, and I, I just, I finally said to him, I said, you have to learn when to say when. He had torn his ACL, one or two of them, five times. He had had five ACL tears in his career. And I said, what about, you know, I said, what about your parents? He's like, oh, well, my dad has had a torn labrum. My mom had a torn labrum in her hip. She tore her meniscus. And I said, you, you've inherited some, some bad structure. And I'm thinking maybe you should find a different sport. Um, okay, because he really is. He's a 26-year-old guy who's had five ACL reconstructions. That's, that's a lot on those knees. And he's really tall. He's like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, so he's got these really long levers. So long term, I would be concerned about the health of his knees. Okay, so these are the things that can kind of turn on the OA. All right, so we talked a little bit about this alignment. This is important. So if you have normal alignment in your knees, for example, that load is going to be distributed kind of on both sides of the joint, if you will. If, you're, if you stand in what we call knee varus, you're going to load more the inside. If you stand in valgus, you're going to load more of the outside. Some of this is fixable and some of this is not. Um, and again, here's just a picture of a normal hip with a nice round ball and socket. And then you can see there's just a, a picture of some worn articular cartilage there. All right, so how do we fix this? Oh my gosh. Well, what I say is the earlier the better. So 
a lifetime of health and fitness, you've already started preventing your osteoarthritis, which is fantastic. And it's never too late. Um, I'm going to tell, <laughs> tell you a story about my mother. Um, God rest her soul. Um, my mom, so she has two daughters that are PTs, and my husband's also a PT. So she has like lots of medical advice floating around her house. Um, and when she was in her 60s, early 60s, she started having some low back pain in my small town, Carolina. And I said, Mom, why don't you go see Dan? Because we only have one PT. Dan, go see Dan, the PT. All right, well, I'll go see Dan. Dan says, you know, I'm a little weak. I need to get a little stronger. So he, he started me on this strength training program at the gym. Great. So we have this little local YMCA. So my mom goes and does her weightlifting, whatever. Um, and through this, she, she was not overweight by any token of the word, but she lost maybe seven or 10 pounds, got, you know, started doing a walking program, things like that. <laughs> I'll never forget this. She said to Lori and me, I said, well, what do, you, what do you think of this, Mom? She said, oh, this weight training stuff, this is something. You girls ought to give it a try. <laughs> and I thought, what is it you think I do for a living, Mother? So anyways, so at age 60, never setting foot in a, in a weight room before, she started a, tra a strength training program, and she was in the weight room till probably three weeks before she passed away. So she was so committed to it. It was, it was amazing. It was a huge lifestyle change for her. And those people became her friends. It was her social outlet. And she, oh gosh, I need to get in there. I, I need to burn off some steam. She loved it. So just know it's never, too, it's never too late to start. So let's talk about conservative care. How am I going to manage this? I got a little osteoarthritis. What am I going to do? This, unfortunately, is an extremely busy table. Um, and it, the color did not show up very well, so I'll kind of talk you through it. But this was a really nice um, kind of summative, summative review of the literature that came out. And what they did is they went through all these different interventions for the hand, the hip, and the knee. And they said, what, what does the research say we can strongly recommend? What should we be doing? And then there was the fence sitting. Well, maybe we can recommend it. And then they also came back with, you should not be doing this. So you can see it's very interesting that for some things, it was a hard and fast no, but arthritis at a different joint, it was like, well, maybe. And so we can't just take a blanket statement and say, yep, that's good for your arthritis, or nope, this won't work for your arthritis. It's very joint as well as person specific. So the ones that came back strongly recommended, I'm going to go through in these subsequent slides. So don't worry if you can't. Like, I can't read that because the color's bad. I'll help you out. Ha! Strong recommended. Guess what? Exercise. All right? Exercise is really good. Here are the tidbits that came out of this study, though. Um, recommendations should focus on the patient's preferences and accessibility. I am not going to recommend to someone who lives in a town of 300 people that they should do aquatic therapy because there's probably not a pool in that town, right? It's got to be accessible. Um, um, so it has to be enjoyable and accessible. So as my sister always says, know thyself. So for me, I like going to a gym. I like going to a gym. I like interacting with people, and that's the way I like to exercise. My sister likes to be in the basement and have no one talk to her. And she gets out when she watches whatever she wants to watch on Netflix, and that's her quiet time. So she doesn't want to be in a gym. She doesn't want to be with people. I do. And so you have to know what's going to work for you. So as a physical therapist, that's one of the questions I ask. What, what gets you excited? Oh, gosh, I love being outside. All right, let's talk about ways that we can get you exercising outside. Okay? Um, if they can't afford to participate or arrange transportation, that's going to be a problem as well. Again, there's so many things we can do that do not necessarily require a gym um, and do not necessarily require money. As a matter of fact, there was a study that came out that showed that lifelong exercisers don't belong to a gym. So they're people who go out and do things, explore nature, things like that. So you don't have to have a gym membership. The big thing, and I think this is what's really important and why it's important to see a physical therapist, is what they found with all these studies is the advice needs to be as specific as possible rather than, hey, just, just go out and do some exercise, just go do some squats. It has to be customized to you, and that is where the role of the physical therapist is so very, very important. So if I understand what's going on in your knee joint and I understand what you enjoy to do, I can design a program that gets you doing what you want to do safely and effectively. 
So I will have people say to me, so just a little sidebar, my husband is, as you know, is a PT and he has a private practice. We don't practice together. That's why we're still married. Um, <laughs> but I'll occasionally, if he needs help or something, I'll occasionally bop in and see him and see patients for him. Um, but, um, oh God, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I know. People will come up to me and say, well, I didn't want to come to physical therapy with the osteoarthritis in my knee because I figured you were going to tell me I could never, ever run again. I'm not going to tell you that. Does running bring you joy? Well, gosh, my granddaughter wants me to do this 5K with her. It's something called Girls on the Run, and she's training to do this 5K, and she needs somebody to run with her, and she really wants me to run with her, but I figured you'd tell me I could never do that. I'm never going to say that. I'm not going to say never, ever, ever do something again. All right, let's talk this through. So what is the minimum amount of running or jogging you need to do to get you ready for this race? Because I don't want you to just go out there one day and run. So is, if you have osteoarthritis, bad OA in your knee, I'm going to say running should not be your mainstay of cardiovascular activity. We should get you doing something where there's not a, loading, not a lot of loading. Perhaps biking is good for you. Um, an elliptical is good for you. Maybe low impact aerobics is good for you. We're gonna to have to do some impact to get you ready for that race, but that's not gonna be the bread and butter of your cardiovascular. It's gonna be a little thing we do on the side, but we're gonna get you to do that. You can do that. You might be a little sore for a couple days afterwards, but gosh, if that's really important to you, that's important to you and your family, we're gonna figure this out. I, I really, there are very few times in my life I say never say never. Like there are very few times I'll say, you absolutely cannot do that. It just, you, you, there's workarounds. And that's why seeing a PT is so important. All right, so as a general rule, when you have osteoarthritis, intermittent compression, up, down, up, down, is better than a constant mechanical stretch or stress. So a fluid pump, you want to move that synovial fluid around as best you can. So, you know, the saying, motion is lotion, it's really true. So motion and load are very important aspects. You need lots of motion, but not a ton of load. Biking is ideal for that because it beautifully moves your joints around without a lot of pounding. Okay. Biking is great. Swimming, water, exercise. You have to know how to bike. Um, I see it every year. I see somebody biking up some big hill, Bascom Hill or whatever, and they're just like this. <laughs> Cranking. That, is, that will tear up your joints. That is terrible. So it's the whole spin, 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 spin. You have to make sure you're, that your seat is uh, set up appropriately and things like that. But biking is a great lifetime sport for people. Okay, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, water exercise is great. Swimming is great. We can find something where we, we can get you to exercise. We'll figure it out. Okay, static loads should be brief. So I, I will tell you that how many of you walk around the farmer's market and the next day you're a little sore and achy? Anybody besides me? Right? Well, not the farmer's market, but I walk a lot. You, you walk a lot, but it's the static standing. So that static standing, you're standing in line to wait to do something, um, standing in line for a long time at the grocery. Those of you who do a lot of cooking or baking, you're that static standing in your kitchen, that is actually terrible for your joints. They don't like that. They want to move. So that static load should be brief, okay? So we don't like you standing for a prolonged period of time. And if you're sh and shearing the joint is actually most detrimental. Most things that create a shear are higher level activities, higher level sports, so we don't have to worry about that. What do you mean by a shear? A shear is instead of the joint going like this, it goes like this. And so you can imagine if you've, um, if you're standing and you're compressing your joint and you grind it like this, the arth it's not going to be happy with your arthritis. So. And you have to do kind of awkward things to shear as a general rule. So you need to create that fluid pump. You just need to keep pumping that fluid around. You, constant movement is good. If you sit for a little bit and you watch basketball, get up and walk around. Don't sit for three or four hours and watch basketball, okay? Not continuously, anyway. All right, so the type of load is really important. We think about that when we design programs. That articular cartilage, it does need some load because it will actually deteriorate when it's unloaded. But you have to be appropriate with your loading. So impulsive loading is detrimental to articular cartilage um, oh, and subchondral bone. So I'm going to say this, and I'm probably going to get crucified for it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so 
two of our wrestling coaches decided last summer to do a 100 mile run with a buddy of theirs who's a very, very high level athlete who does 100 mile runs. And they're in excellent physical shape. Our, our wrestling coaches are in fantastic shape, right? They're strong, they're powerful, they do tons of cardio, but they don't load their joints for that kind of load for 100 miles. So that was somewhat impulsive, right? Because they didn't train for it. They're like, well, you know, we're, we're moving around good enough. They didn't, they didn't train their articular cartilage enough. And um, the day after the race, they were both coming in asking for crutches. So, and they got over it, but you don't want to do that kind of loading. So the classic example of the grandma who wants to run the 5K with her granddaughter, we need to slowly introduce loading, okay? So you're gonna do a half mile, then you're gonna work up to a mile, then you work up to a mile and a half. So your articular cartilage gets used to that load. Oh, I know what you want me to do, you're gonna load me, okay? So just randomly going out and doing high level activities without preparing for it is not good. So weekend warriors are not so good. So people who do nothing all week and then go crazy on the weekends, that is not good for your articular cartilage. It's actually better to spread it out over the course of the week than to do it only on the weekends. So people who, for example, train for marathons, it's important that you do those three mile, four mile, six mile runs during the week, not necessarily for cardiovascular, but to remind your articular cartilage that you're gonna drive it crazy on the weekend, that we're gonna pump it up on the weekends. So to just go, go from zero to 100 miles an hour is not good for your articular cartilage. Okay, I say your articular cartilage has memory. That's usually what I say. So here's a really good example of somebody who has what I would call lateral compartment DJD. So you can see on the knee on the left, there's joint approximation there. So we would call that unicompartmental or one-sided DJD. And somehow as a physical therapist, what I would do is I'd figure out how to unload that side. I'd like to distribute that load more evenly. So for me, it may be something like I put an, um, an insert in their shoe on one side that kind of changes the pitch of their tibia, that, that bottom bone a little bit, to see if I can distribute the load a little bit differently. There are unloader braces out there that have a three-point pressure system that also can shift the load that a lot of people like. So for me, I'm thinking, you know, you have one compartment that looks really good, one compartment that doesn't look so good. So let's take some of the load that's on that lateral compartment, that outside compartment, and see if we can distribute all the load more evenly and see if that makes you feel better. Okay? How you load somebody is really important. So as a physical therapist, one of the things I do, if somebody comes in and they're hot and bothered, I may have to completely unload them and say, you know what, your joint is so angry right now that to exercise or get you to move, we need to unload you, okay? We just, it just needs a break. And you'll, and you'll have people say, oh my God, I just feel so good when I'm unloaded. And one of the best ways to do that is a pool. So doing some exercise in a pool, again, designed by a physical therapist, is really important. You can't just go in the pool and splash around. You gotta know what you're doing. Um, so pool works really well. There are um, these unweighted treadmill systems, which is the picture kind of on the bottom middle where it's a harness system, so it supports you as you walk on a treadmill. And then this really cool picture here in, on the bottom left is something called an Alter-G, or an Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. Anybody seen one? Anybody been in one? So there are clinics in town that have these. Um, we actually have two in UW Athletics. They're pretty cool. So what happens is you put on a pair of these super tight spandex shorts, and they have a zipper in them, and you zip the zipper to this big balloon that is all the way around you, and it kind of lifts you up and weighs you, and you can then run at a very set percentage of your body weight. It's like running on the moon, it really is. So if you go, if you're like only 20% weight bearing, I will tell you anecdotally that it really messes up your gait and your mechanics and it doesn't work so well. But at about 50% weight bearing, it's, it's really great. So in my population, for example, if somebody's, for just introducing impact, we'll put them in the Alter G. Um, somebody who has a stress fraction, we're trying to introduce impact again, we'll put them in the Alter G. So these are really nice for people who have lower extremity arthritis and you want to look at their gait, you want to look how they're walking, um, you can put them in an Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. A lot of people prefer this over a pool because they don't want to get wet. Great. The downside of this is you can really only work in, in the forward 
plane. You can't do sideways or anything like that. In the pool, you can do those sideways things. So all of these things would unload you in kind of a different way. So as a physical therapist, I'd have to decide what was best for my patient. Okay, maybe they need things outside of the forward or sagittal plane, and I want them to work in the frontal plane. Then I'd use the pool. If I really want to work on their walking mechanics, the Alter G might be the way to go. And the Alter G is pretty cool. It has this, it has windows on this side and a window in the front, the big plastic, so you can actually watch people's gait mechanics. Pretty cool. They're not inexpensive. Um, my husband has one in his clinic. That's my summer home right there. <laughs> it was either we could buy a lake house or get an Alter G. Have an Alter G. They're great though. Okay, so as people, if they're really flared up, as they start getting better, I have to eventually get them out of this unloaded position, right? I can't keep them unloaded forever. I just told you that your articular cartilage needs to be loaded a little bit. So it's finding that balance of unloaded activity where I can move and I can get all my range of motion and I can do some strengthening and loading me because A, my bones need it from a bone mineral density perspective and my articular cartilage needs it a little bit, it's finding that balance. And that's what a physical therapist is really good at. Um, because people will go, oh, I did a whole bunch of exercise in the pool, and then they leave the pool and they think they can do the exact same thing on land, and you probably can't. Your joints will not take it. So we start with kind of a balance, and then eventually we want to get them to doing things that are um, more loaded on land because that's how we all function. All right, what about muscle performance? What about this strength business, Jill? You keep talking about how important it is to be strong. So you can do, so people who have painful joints will say things like, oh gosh, I can't go through this whole range of motion in my knee or my hip because it really hurts. So how am I gonna get stronger if I can't do this and it's painful? So then one of the things we start with as physical therapists is something called an isometric. So instead of having you do this squat, I would have you do what I call an iso hold and come down to this position and just hold it. If I go lower, it hurts. Don't go lower, okay, stay here, okay? I can come up here, hold it here. What we know is from those isometrics is whatever angle I'm at, so let's just say I'm at 30 degrees of knee flexion, the strength I experience by doing this will carry over from 20 to 40 degrees. So I'm, I'm probably getting at that painful area without going through it. So a physical therapist can help you design that and say, okay, you have this painful range. How am I gonna get stronger through that? We have a way for you, okay? So there's a lot of good, thing that's, good things that come about doing an isometric exercise. The problem is I am compressing my joint. I'm not shearing it, I'm compressing it, which is okay unless your joint isn't lined up very well then it could be problematic. So there are people who have kind of kitty wampus joints and they go and try and do an iso or an isometric and they say it still hurts. I'm like, it's because there's still too much load going through one side. Then we can fix their feet and stuff like that and maybe try it again. Okay, so there's pros and cons to isometrics, but it's a really nice option for people who have pain through the entire range of motion and you want to somehow get them stronger. So, you know, <laughs> A lot of people say, well, it hurts when I go through this whole range of motion. And I'm like, oh, that's just a cop-out because I have an idea for you. Oh, so, okay. All right. <laughs> so the other thing is we like to do what we call closed chain exercises. Does anybody know what that is? So closed chain is when your foot is planted and you're moving about a fixed distal extremity. So squats are closed chain versus kicking a ball or doing something like this is open chain. Squats, particularly in the lower extremity, or closed chain exercises in the lower extremity, are incredibly functional. They're functional from sit to stand, going upstairs, getting in and out of a car. And so for all those reasons, we have a tendency to do more closed chain exercise in the lower extremity. Then you have people that say, it hurts even when I do my body weight. I can't do my body weight. It hurts too much my joints. And then I say, oh, but we have a way around that too. So we have things in the clinic like this. This is called a shuttle or it's a modified leg press where you can do less than your body weight in using that device so you can still get stronger until your strength takes over. Then eventually we can move you off of there and now you have enough muscle strength 
that you don't have as much um, load going through the joint, and now you can finally get stuff done body weight on land. Okay, so if you can't do body weight just yet, that's okay. We have an option for that as well. Okay, we have a tool to fix that. So other things that came back as a strong recommendation in this wonderful paper were weight loss, which we've kind of talked about. Typically, that's not in my wheelhouse. I don't talk to people about that. I'll, I'll talk to them and educate them about how weight loss can improve their knee pain or how it can improve their knee pain. I'll talk to them about the percent body weight that goes through your joint when you do an activity. So about three times your body weight goes through your joints every time you walk. Running is anywhere from five to seven. So as you can imagine, maybe a 10 pound decrease in weight could really make an impact for people. So I talked to them about that and then they're like, oh, I don't know about my diet. I refer that. I refer to a, register, a registered dietitian. That's, that's not my pay grade. I can tell them about the benefits of weight loss. I can't tell them how to do it. Um, the other thing that came back really high, which is so funny, is Tai Chi came back as something that they strongly recommend. It's great exercise. What baffles me is if you look at the table, one of the things that didn't come back as a strong recommendation is balance. And isn't Tai Chi, a huge part of Tai Chi is balance. So I, I like to think that somehow they overlook this. I think balance is really important and, and Tai Chi is a great way to get at, at, at balance. Does anybody here practice Tai Chi? Yeah. You did, wonderful. When I was young. Easy. Yesterday. So my co my co instructor that I teach the ortho courses courses with does a ton on Tai Chi. She teaches it. She's trained in it. She teaches people how to be teachers in it, um, and she does a lot of research in it. So um, Tai Chi is a great thing to do. And then the other thing that came back as a strong recommendation is giving people control over their rehab and exercises ideas. So offer them some options and let them choose. So. It's, it's really teaching them how to manage it themselves. It goes back to that comment I made earlier. You know, no offense, but I hope I never see you again. And, and that's part of it is I want to teach them how to manage this themselves. So give them some options and, and let them run with them. So things that I think that unfortunately didn't come back as strong recommendations, but in my wheelhouse, they are low risk and potential very high reward. In other words, I really can't go wrong with this. Surface. Surface is a really big thing. Um, so if I have arthritis in my knees or my hips, I'm not absorbing very much shock there. And somewhere in this chain, I have to absorb shock. I have to be better about it. So options I have are um, footwear and surface. Shoes are so important. Shoes are so important. So, so I read somewhere in a fashion magazine, because I read a lot of fashion magazines, I'm kidding. So um, I read somewhere that as a woman, you should spend most of your money here and then less as you go down your body. And as a physical therapist, I spend most of my money here and less as I go up. So I dress every day starting with my shoes. Where am I going? What am I doing today? And what shoes do I need to wear? I'm going to run around a whole bunch. OK, I need to wear these shoes, these shoes. Oh, I'm really going to be sitting a lot. I don't have to do a lot of walking. OK, I can wear these shoes that maybe don't offer as much support. So I think wearing shoes is so, good shoes is so, so important. And the other thing I think is people let their shoes wear out. Do you know how many miles you should be putting on a pair of shoes, like a pair of tennis shoes, before they're pfft. Like a runner. How many miles should a runner put on a pair of shoes? 400. Who said that? Right on the money. They say around 400. If your shoes get wet, like tonight, about 200, OK? Because water really does beat up, beat up on your shoes. OK, so shoe wear is really, really, really important. The other thing I tell people is if you stand in your kitchen a long time, getting some of those fatigue resistant mats, they're delightful. They are worth your penny. Give them a go. See if it doesn't make a difference. I think that's really important. If you're a walker, and you know, unfortunately, this happens in the dead of winter, people hit the malls. And that surface is just terrible. It's awful, right? It's really hard on your feet. It's just concrete. Um, so if you can find a track, even if it's an indoor track, it's much better surface, OK? The other thing I will recommend is um, shoe inserts. So a lot of research has been done. You need custom orthotics, off-the-shelf. Take-home messages, an off-the-shelf orthotic works just fine. So I recommend a couple off-the-shelf orthotics if, if you need extra support, more support. 
I personally like super feet. They come in a bunch of different colors, different resistances, things like that. I think they're delightful. My husband recommends a different brand, and I can't remember what it is, but he brought me a pair home the other day and said, try these. And I like them. They're, in the, they're my, not in these shoes, but they're in other pair of shoes I have. Okay? So I think a lot about footwear because if my joints are kind of compressed, I need to absorb shock somewhere. So this could be low risk, high reward. All right, what about pharmacologic management? What about drugs? All right, let's talk about this. So the paper looked at this as well. So are there medications or something that they highly recommend? And this is what kind of blew me away. I would think if you were taking a systemic medication, it would impact all the joints the same. But here in this study, or this accumulation of research, that was not the case. So topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, I'll show you that in a minute, came back as strongly recommended for the knee, may be recommended for the hand, and no recommendation whatsoever at the hip. Hmm. The only thing I can think of is the hip is a very deep joint, and maybe the topical agents couldn't reach it, as opposed to um, the hand and the knee. It's my only thought. But I was really baffled by this, because I really thought it would just be this blanket, you know, whatever drugs. If you took some sort of systemic drug, it wouldn't matter what it is, et cetera. So we're going to talk a little bit about things that kind of came out as winner, winner, chicken dinner. So topical agents that are over the counter. There are counter irritants, such as your Icy Hot or Capsaicin. Um, oh, God, what was the other brand? You could always tell when you were sitting next to somebody who had it on. Bengay, that kind of stuff. Okay, yep. You can always smell somebody's got their Bengay on. Um, it can't hurt. It might help. So the research didn't really support it. They are counter irritants. So in other words, they send a different message to your brain then the, they basically get your pain. So you're not feeling the pain, you're feeling whatever that irritant was that you put on your, your skin. The interesting thing that came out is that the topical non-steroidals that come in a patch or a gel, um, the DSG um, patches, or it comes in a gel like this, came out as being helpful, as opposed to capsaicin, which did not. So I was a little baffled by this. So if you're going to go to the store and you're standing in line, and you're like, I don't know which one of these to get, try the um, diclofenac gel. Because in the research, it shows to be better than the capsation. And I can't explain why. I don't know. But it does. Does capsation mean that it comes from peppers? There you go. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. So, so oral non-steroidals are overall helpful. I just think there's so many things that go with taking an oral drug. You have to make sure that it does not interact with your other medications and or you have to watch for GI upset. So a lot of patients are hesitant to do that and I understand that. If we can find things with physical therapy or other strategies that aren't a systemic um, type of intervention, let's go for it. So they're out there. A lot of people prescribe them. It's, I try and work around it. Corticosteroid injections. Who's had a, a joint injected? Anybody? What joint? Uh, the ankle. The ankle? You had a corticosteroid injection in your ankle? Mm -hmm. For what? Well, I had polio, and so my, my tendons I have a tendency to become very inflamed. There you go. So that's a perfect pre-existing, pre, you had a trauma at that ankle. That makes total sense because that would not be the first joint I would pick. Nobody's had an intraarticular knee injection, hip injection? Good. Let's keep it that way. Oh, you have. In what? Hip. hip. Okay. Did it help? Diagnostic. Oh, diagnostic. Okay. So, and, so a diagnostic, so did you have a MRA or was it just a diagnostic injection with some lidocaine? They just inject you with some corticosteroid, maybe a little bit of numbing stuff. Did it help? Uh, yeah. Okay, so then that tells us that indeed the pain you're experiencing is coming from your hip, right? So they will use these diagnostically. That's a great example. And if in, especially in the hip, because hip, low back are so intimately related, we don't know where that's coming from. It's coming from my hip, coming from my back. I don't know. And so it can be helped diagnostically. We inject this in your hip, and you're better than your hip. What we're seeing on the x-ray, what we're seeing on the MRI, that is what is driving your pain. So you will hear people have that done. As a general rule, it says you don't want any more than four a year in a single joint. I, four is, I would, not, I would not go more than a couple, okay? It's because it can eat at your articular cartilage. Again, Pac-Man, eating at your articular cartilage. So there is a place for this. 
but it has to be used very judiciously. So where I like it is when people are so wound up or their OA is so severe, they can't tolerate the oral medications and they can't get physical therapy jump started to get that corticosteroid injection so they can do their rehab is a good place for it. I do not like getting an injection and not being sent to physical therapy. So if you're gonna give an injection, get things calmed down, teach them how to manage their knee so it doesn't get flared back up again. One of my favorites was a woman who danced the night away at her son's wedding um, and got her knee all flared up and she could not get it flared back down. And she went to the doctor and she said, I just need a shot so therapy will work. And so he gave her the injection, she came back to therapy and we got her going again. Um, but she could not get her rehab jump started, she was just too flared up. What about nutraceuticals? So glucosamine, chondroitin, anybody taking those? Yeah, you've tried them, tried them. Any luck with them? No? Luck in what joint? Or like every Knees? Okay, great. Can I ask you how long you had to take them before you saw the improvement? Um, not very long. Oh, great. You're an exception. You're an exception. So you're an exception, for sure. So I was, I, historically I've been really on board as it's worth a shot to take glucosamine, chondroitin together. You take them together? Combo? Yep. Mm -hmm. Who said no, no bueno for you? No good? So that's always the million dollar question. So for a while, research said you gotta take a couple months of it before you can see the benefits of it. That's why I asked you. Um, and it needs to be taken together. And it's fallen out of favor that there's just not that much benefit to it. But here's the deal. I'm not gonna say don't do it. There's always people out there anecdotally that say, well, it really works for me. Okay, it's worth a shot. So the biggest thing that I always wanna make sure of is that it's not, um, contraindicated or not gonna impact other medications they take. That's really important. So I always wanna to talk to your physician or pharmacist about it. Am I going over? No, you're fine, keep going, it's great. How do you control for the placebo effect? Well, that's a great question too, you really can't. But maybe, that, maybe that's all, maybe, maybe the placebo effect is fine. I feel better, okay, then go exercise. So I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I hear ya. So just in the last few years, has there been evidence that has kind of swung the pendulum and say, oh, we're probably not helpful. But there's always people out there that say, gosh, it really does help me. And I'm not going to say, well, this paper says don't take it. If it helps you, take it, OK? It's just not going to be the first thing I recommend. All right, what about hyaluronic acid injections? You guys know what these are? Yeah, have you had, Mr. Bad Knee, have you had these? No? OK, good. Anybody had them? HA injections? OK. Um, so, <laughs> oh, shoot. I got too cared. I got to back up, sorry. There we go. Okay, so these are injected into the joint, but they are not a corticosteroid. What we know is that joints with arthritis have decreased hyaluronic acid, and these molecules that are in the synovial fluid play a role of kind of lubricating the joint and shock absorption. So you want these in your joint. You want to have these in your joint. And what we know is that people with OA don't have as many. So why don't we put some in there and see what happens? So. These are kind of, this is just a list of different um, hyaluronic acid injections by trade name. So people typically recognize names like Synvisc or Orthovisc as the injections. And this is a series of injections. So it typically takes a couple before you'll see the changes. And as you can see, the number of injections per treatment course is anywhere from three to five. Most people usually see changes at about three. Now, the hyaluronic acid, or hyaluronic acid source, that's what avian means. Do you know where these come from? Rooster combs. So the little combs are those little things on top of roosters. That's where we find hyaluronic acid. So I want to know who sat around and said, hey, let's look at this bird, and let's see what's going on in there, and let's see if we somehow take those and inject them into people's knees, they get better. Because it just blows my mind that someone thought of that. But this is one of the <laughs> sources for hyaluronic acid are rooster combs, which I just think is kind of funny. Um, if you ever listen to the Larry Mueller show, Larry will tell you that he was set to have an arthroscopic knee surgery because he had a little tear in his meniscus and he was set to have a meniscectomy and he had one of these injections and they told him to wait about three weeks and you know, at two weeks he hadn't seen any change and he had a surgery scheduled. And then about at two and a half weeks, he woke up and he's like, I feel better. Maybe it's a placebo. I don't know. That was seven years ago. 
So he's like, I had one shot and it was a game changer. So if people call in and ask about NEOA, Larry usually tells the story. So for the knee, which is really the only place it's found to be effective, it's not effective in the hip. Again, it, I, I don't know why. Like, it's all arthritis, but clearly it's different. So typically you need a few injections, two to four. Um, but interestingly, in another study, PT seemed to have greater effects or was just as good as those intra-articular intra injections. So the take-home message is hyaluronic acid injections work in the knee, but you should really try physical therapy first. So let's exhaust those non-invasive things before you start having injections and things like that. Okay, we're going here. This is, this is not my wheelhouse. I'm just going to put that out there, but I get asked this question a lot. So what about CBD oil? Anybody use it? Take it? Gummies? Anybody? Okay, it's okay. It's a marijuana extract, and it does not, in theory, produce the intoxication because it does not have the chemical THC in it. Those lovers are supposed to be extremely low. It's supposed to be extremely low in CBD oil. It's supposed to be low. Um, this is legal in all 50 states, um, and Wisconsin has very specific laws on the books, and it got passed through in some sort of farming law, so it, it kind of got bundled in with farming or agriculture. In the state of Wisconsin, um, it is legal as long as the amount of THC is less than 0.3%. Okay. Now, this is a lot of words. Oh, Jill, it's a lot of words for 8 o'clock at night. This was a really nice study that came out of Mayo Clinic. A couple of physicians in Mayo wrote kind of just some facts about CBD because it's important. Patients come in and ask. Um, so there have not been a lot of studies done on, human, on humans. There's a lot on rats, but not a lot on humans that talk about this. Um, it's a concerning area because... Um, as we know, there's a lack of regulation. So this is kind of a nice summary slide. I'm going to break it down in the next few um, slides here. So the place there's, where there is a lot of evidence for using CBD oil is in treating epilepsy. Okay, that's where it was really first kind of came out, was, was as a treatment for epilepsy. The rest of the potential uses that we know for arthritis, things like that, there is little to no evidence and mostly, unfortunately, it's done on rats. The tricky thing about CBD oil is there's no FDA restrictions or regulations on this because it's considered a supplement. And so, interestingly, a study that was done, seven of 10 CBD products didn't contain the amount of marijuana extract promised on the label. About half had too little and a fourth had too much, right? And 20% of the products contained THC. So because there's not thorough regulation on this, it becomes very challenging to recommend this um, as a healthcare professional. So the bottom line is, boy, these shops are popping up everywhere. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. You, you can buy that anywhere now. But it is not FDA regulated. So unfortunately, there is inconsistency in the label versus the actual product. And THC may be in there, and that's a problem as well. And the other thing is you have to think very carefully about how this is, how this interacts with other prescribed medications. So when a patient asks me about this, I always, always say, you need to speak with your physician about this. It's really important. I don't know how this would interact with your other medications. And that physician may have a brand or a um, shop that he feels is consistently a good place to purchase CBD products because, because of the lack of regulation, it becomes, it becomes pretty problematic. So this is something that I personally do not recommend for my patients when they ask about it. I share this information with them and I say, you really need to speak with your physician about it. It's really important. So just remember that these, these and other nutraceuticals are not FDA regulated, so there's no requirement for scientific testing or quality control is not mandate, mandated. So it's a problem, okay? So just keep that in mind if you're ever thinking about the nutraceuticals path. So when, when do we, for lack of better terms, throw in the proverbial towel? When, when do we say conservative management for your arthritis patient, unfortunately, has failed? When, when do I have to say that? So from a scientific perspective, 
Typically what they say is that um, they have an, a patient hasn't experienced a reduction in their symptoms, so they are not seeing an improvement on the Womack pain scale, which is an outcome tool that physical therapists use. And per plane radiographs, they are losing joint space. Um, what I say is when your bad days start outweighing your good days, when you feel that your lack of mobility is really impeding other systemic diseases such as diabetes. So if you can no longer walk or do your cardiovascular activity that keeps other systemic diseases under control, it's probably time to start thinking that you have exhausted conservative management and we might need to look at other things. The biggest thing I will, I will see people and it, it just makes me chuckle is they'll stop exercise and say, well, I gotta have a total hip anyway, or I gotta have a total knee anyway, so I'm just, I'm giving up on all that stuff. I don't want people to throw in the towel. So if the activities that you are doing, you used to be able to do and you used to be able to do them without pain, but all of a sudden they're painful, don't quit exercising, don't throw in the towel, go back for a checkup, see your physical therapist, Maybe you can modify some things so you can maintain your strength, maintain your mobility, regardless of whether you have to have a surgical intervention, you're going to be so much better on the other side if you do that. So don't give up, don't throw in the towel, we may just need to modify some things for you. And I think that's really important. But I, as a, as a general rule, I kind of use the, gosh, when your bad days start out weighing your good days, probably time, especially if you feel it's starting to impact other systems in your body. So that's kind of my summary for when the bad days outweigh the good days. That's kind of what your knees look like. And this is just, <laughs> right? This just kind of summarizes our culture, unfortunately. Um, people all want you know, pills and surgery, and they want things to be fixed that way. Unfortunately, lifestyle change is not easy. Um, but long term, it's such a wonderful thing to do. So my mother at age 60, started lifting weight, she made a lifestyle change, and her last, she passed away at 83, so her last 23 years of her life, she had incredible quality of life. Um, she lived in her house until she passed away, lived by herself, independently, legally blind, in her house, until she passed away in 80, at, what, at 83 years old. So, and she was strong, she could do things, oh my God, the stuff she did just uh, made me crazy, but yeah, but just, she made a lifestyle change, and so, it's never too late, you can do it, and I usually tell people start with small changes. Don't do this whole radical thing. Start with just picking off one or two little things. Um, and you know, if you have some arthritic changes, get after them early, see a physical therapist, couple visits, get a good program going. Just like you go into the doctor for a checkup, go get a checkup on that joint. How's my joint doing? Do I need to make any changes? My rehab's getting easy. These exercises are too easy. This exercise is really hard. We can change them, we're happy to do that. So that's all I have for you. Do you have any questions for me? Yes. One of the exercises I've heard, especially for seniors in, in senior housing and things mm -hmm. like this, is um, when there's a lack of mobility, is light weights on the ankle and just, just lifting. I, what, what, how, how do you feel about that particular so Can you open, repeat the question, please? Yep, so if somebody has some overall weakness and one option, for example, if they can't do, you're talking about, so if, they're, if balance is an issue and you're afraid that doing some of these closed chain exercises like a squat or something could put them at risk for a fall, could I sit and put an ankle weight on my ankle and do some kicking out? And that is a fine exercise to do. Um, what happens with a lot of people that are elderly is we know that we can load them probably more than they think they can be. So starting with a light weight is fine, but just know that we, we can load them up. They, they can actually tolerate a fair amount of load as long as it's safe and make sure they have supervision. But yeah, it's totally fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything to build up endurance, I'm totally on board. 100%. So you got a question and then a question. Yeah. And then I'll come this way. Yes. My question is, so what's the magic formula with <laughs> weight training and repetition? It's kind of like weight training, you either bulk up or you actually kind of like you, when you do more repetition, you're never bulking up, mm -hmm. but your muscle become better at your cardio. Right. So what is the magic balance, which, and that's when I chuckled, um, with weight training? So. Like, you physical therapist, 
mm -hmm. like so typically we we gauge it based on your one rep max or your 10 rep max so for example let's say we want to do an upper extremity strength training exercise so we have you do like the the, the weight you can do for 10 repetitions. And then there's nice little formulas on tables. And then you typically start with like 60% of a rep max. Then you move to 70% of a rep max, 80%. You kind of work through that. That's one way to do it. Um, and you won't get that bulky. So I hear the whole, I don't want to bulk up kind of thing. And I, I totally understand that. The first six weeks of a strength training program are all neuromuscular re-education. They're all training your brain how to move. And that's really the first six weeks. The, the strength, like the true muscle hypertrophy, things like that, don't happen until after that happens. And so those first six weeks are really more movement awareness, which is what most people need, I think. Um, so depending on what your needs are, um, there are different ways that we design programs. So for example, if it's a postural muscle, like everybody's gluteus medius, you know, everybody's got these hips that drop and stuff. This gluteus medius, this is an endurance muscle. It needs to hold me up all day long. So in that case, I wouldn't put a lot of weight on there, but boy, am I doing these things all day long. So then I'm thinking more endurance. So not only do you have to think about the person, you have to think about the muscle and how they're using it. So I wish there were a magic formula, but there's not. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yes? Um, are there any studies as far as whether or not people that of college age that are not athletically involved do they have higher or lower OA rates than athletes? So, are, that's great. So, are you talking about, so, are non-athletic college individuals, do they have a different OA rate than college athletes? Right. Is that what your question? Okay. So, I would say a college athlete who's incurred an injury of some sort will have a higher osteoarthritis rate. The athlete who has not incurred an injury, they're probably about the same. Um, and you have to think about loading and obesity, sedentary lifestyles, all that goes into the mix as well. I will tell you anecdotally, um, one of the things we work on a lot with um, our football guys who are um, upon completing their career at Wisconsin who are going to become non-athletic regular people, so they're just going to go be normal humans. Um, one of the big things that we talk to them about is, and you got to it a little bit about frame size, their frame and the load that they have on their frame. Because they put a ton of load on a frame that, and by frame I mean musculoskeletal frame, that we want off of them if they're not going to be playing football. So we'll have football players who we encourage to very wisely and selectively lose a lot of weight without losing muscle mass. Um, we had one of our football, one of our tight ends ended up losing about 75 pounds um, just because he had bulked up so much and he really did need to lose that. His dad had had a total knee replacement at 55 and that scared the crap out of him. And I, I see him fairly frequently and he's done a great job of managing his weight for his frame size, feels great, does really well. But he, he took about a year to take it off and made sure he wasn't just losing muscle mass because that was really important. So, but it, it, took a, it took a year for him to kind of get his body into what it is today. Yeah, he looks amazing. One of the- One of my favorites. Oh, sorry. No, I'm done. One of the things that I didn't see you mention for treatments is injected stem cells, since this is the lectern that Jamie Thompson announced to the world that he figured out to grow human embryonic stem cells. What's your take on stem cells um, to go along with some of the things that you've mentioned in the last 10 minutes of your talk? So um, there's a couple. So with, in the world of articular cartilage, um, there are some s surgical techniques that involve implantation of stem cells that actually work very, very well. Um, but it's a very select population. But, but there's, studies, there, there's stuff out there that works. Um, there's so many factors that go into that is the alignment of the joint, the age, the size of the defect, the stem cells. There's a lot that go into it, but there's, there's, there's things that you can do involving stem cells that will give you a good outcome in the right population. Typically, if people have a fair amount of osteoarthritis in multiple places in their knee or their hip, it's not going to be the first choice. 
Make sense? I don't know. That's why I asked. <laughs> Who else has questions? Yes. <coughs> are my socks oh, done? Oh, no. Your socks okay. are not done. I'm not even to the heels yet. Okay, fine. <laughs> your I'm an eight and a half. <laughs> your ankle joints are not there yet. <laughs> shoes. Yes. Um, I've had physical therapists go, oh, those are really good shoes. But there are other shoes I like to wear that don't have as much internal support but have lots of padding. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those? You know, the, I don't know, all birds, merinos, the yep. really flat, nice, soft padding. Yeah. So I, I feel like in the past four or five years, the literature has really swung that says, if it feels good on your foot, to wear it. It used to be, especially with runners, we'd say, oh, you need a motion control shoe, or oh, you need a rigid this, or you need a rigid that. And we're really kind of going away from it and saying, if you put that shoe on and it feels comfortable for you, it is the right shoe for you. So it's a little trial and error, which people have to be patient with, but um, you may find a style, a brand, or something that works really well for you, and that's A-OK. -okay. One of the physical therapists I work with always wears negative shoes. Do you know what those are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she loves them, swears by them, thinks they were a game changer for her. And she's, and they're like, and she talks about them, and she's like, this is what works for me. What's she a also, negative shoe? A negative shoe is where your heel is lower than the front of your foot. Oh, like the old Birkenstock. An old Birkenstock Earth brand is a really popular Earth shoes. Earth shoes. Yeah. shoes. So I, I can't remember the brand she wears. Maybe. Loves them. She also does toe yoga every day. Like really amazing toe intrinsic foot strengthening. Yeah, and, and people do toe yoga. It's where you... You take your toes and you gotta like move this one out and this one out and curls and this and that and this and that. I'm telling you, she has more dexterity in her toes than anywhere I've seen. She's got really strong feet, and but she loves her negative shoes and she wears them all the time, and that works for her. She feels it made a difference in her knees and her hips. She's a big runner and she she really thinks it was a game changer. So I think we have a future topic for Wednesday night at the lab: toe what? yoga. Shoes? shoes. Toe yoga. Oh, toe yoga. Yeah, toe <laughs> yoga. Yeah, toe yoga is fun. It's just kind of a fun thing to say. Toe yoga. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so has anybody really created a device that instead of redistributing load can actually unload the knee? Not to the best, not to my knowledge, but if anybody is, there's a brand out there that makes a lot of um, knee braces called Osur, O-S-S-U-R. They're Swedish or something, I don't know. Um, and they have really high-tech braces. They have some really nice unloader systems. If anybody's doing it, my guess is they would be one of the first companies to do that. Or DJO, Don Joy Global, or it's another big knee brace company that does some really nice unloader braces. Um, so I can't answer that and say they absolutely don't exist. I don't know that they do. If they do, they're not very commonplace. But yeah, you're right, totally. It'd be cool. A question from online. Yes. Can recommendations for OA management and intervention be given by bin data of age group, B-I-N. I don't know what that is, but. Bin data age group? Given by. Bin data age data group? Of, yes, here you go. I have no idea. I asked what bin was. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't heard from Raj yet. Bin data of age group. Bin data. Bin data. I don't know. I, I, I no, I don't know. Okay. I, I can't answer How about that just, one, I'm sorry. Let's buy data of age group. I'll just. Okay. Okay. Instagram, okay. So I would, I would never. Oh, here it is. Oh, good. I would never. You're right. I would never clump. Ben Date is considering, as example, 20 to 30. No, I would never give a blanket statement about as a 20 to 30 year old, this is what you should be doing. Everybody's knee is so individual. So I think that's what they're getting at is can I take a a 10-year demographic of somebody and make recommendations regarding that? And the answer is no. So I'm going to read what Raj wrote to us because okay. I asked him. He says, bin data is considering as example 20 to 30 age, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 60 to 70, and so on for the age group. And the bin is the age interval. Here the bin interval is 10 years. 
Thank you very much, and thank you, Raj. So it's funny. So one of the, that's a great that's a great question. So um, one of the things that I always ask my physical therapy students: Are you ever too old to have your ACL reconstructed? No, you're not. So if you're a highly active person and you're hiking and biking and doing these multi-directional movements and your knee, because you've torn your ACL somehow, is precluding you from doing those activities, I don't care if you're 25 or 65, you should have your ACL reconstructed. One of my female basketball players at the UW had her ACL reconstructed one month after her grandmother. They did their rehab together. She was a nurse. She was highly active, worked, hiked, did all this stuff, and so they went through their ACL rehab together. And so you're, so age is a consideration, but I would never just put somebody in a compartment based on age. That's, that's a great, great question. Thank you, Raj. Yes. Are the questions else? here? Yeah. Any Are questions? we going to the library afterwards? Yes. <laughs> going to the library afterwards, and yes. Yeah, um, I don't know for sure if I have OA or not, but okay. I am not getting younger at the same rate as I'm used to. <laughs> right. But, um, I find that uh, walking is still my primary method of uh, exercise. Great. But I'm discovering that if I, you know, have a few days, put a few days of not, of sedentary activity in between, that helps to improve the pain in my knee and allows me to resume walking again. So that's homeostasis. That's a great example. So the example was I like to walk for exercise. I feel that if I take a couple days off in between and then I go back to it, it's a good yeah. thing. So that is listening to your body and your body saying, this is a homeostasis. I need to do enough exercise that I get that, but I don't want to tip the scales over. So your joints are, are happy. So you're finding the dose or the volume that works for you. So that's, that's fantastic. In those off days when you're not walking, it would be delightful if maybe you did a little balance or you did some upper extremity strengthening or something like that. But that's homeostasis for your knee. That's perfectly fine. That's a great example. So nope, that's that's totally a okay. And one more, one more sure. remark. Um, I find that as far as static load, mm -hmm. going grocery shopping is probably the worst way right. of occurring. That. It is. Yes. So static loads are terrible. So grocery stores, um, farmers market where you're standing for a prolonged period of time, th those kind of things can be challenging. So again, it goes back to the motion right. is lotion. Yeah. Did I, I yes? Know. Did I keep you guys longer than I'm supposed to? I don't know. No, how long you're I'm supposed fine. To talk. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the advantages. Okay, that's really fine. I just don't. Want, I, I just know that there's something involved after this, and I don't want to keep people. Um, Our time is two o'clock. <laughs> so those padded mats. Are yes. Those, um, memory foam. The, the mats to, to relieve yes. pain when in static. Yeah. Standing. Yep. Working in the kitchen. Yes. Are, is there a particular recommendation about thickness or resistance of the? So that's a great question too. Um, I personally, I literally, I went to Wayfair.com and I found a couple and I bought them and I really like them. Could there be something out there that's better? I don't know. So I think it's probably personal preference. You know, it's the whole, it's the whole baby bear porridge land. You know, it's not too hard, it's not too soft, it's just right for you. And so, and can you clean it? That's the other thing, kitchen. in the kitchen. Um, but, but I think for one person, what may work may not work for another person, so it's going to be a little trial by, by fire and see how you do. Um, it's funny that you say that because we have, um, at athletics, we have a big indoor practice facility, big indoor practice turf. And some people, and it's much thicker, and in my mind, softer than our actual football field. And about half the team loves it, and the other half the team hates it. So there's a classic example of, for some people, that more is better, and for some people, less is better. So we have a lot of people that complain, oh, gosh, I feel so much worse when we're upstairs. So I'm like, oh, my god, please let us go upstairs. I feel so, my joints feel so much better. Speaking so again, of which, um, what type of turf is getting placed on Camp Randall right now? Really expensive. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm no shocked idea. to hear that. I have no idea, what's, I have no idea okay. what they're putting down. Because they're... They ripped up the old green. stuff they're putting, yes. Putting down green turf. Because Boise State has... Blue. Has trademark blue. So. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know, and it's, it's interesting you say that because we have these conversations a lot too. So there's a lot more high schools, in, especially in the upper Midwest, that are going to turf uh, fields. 
because of care and management, it's just really hard to keep a grass field at a high school from a cost, uh, management, things like that going. And so a lot of people are going to turf, and of course they're going to refurbish turf. So, you know, we, we dug up our, our turf and somebody bought it down in somebody else's field. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the high schools are getting that secondhand turf. Um, you get your turf fluffed every year. I don't know if you know that, but there's a turf fluffing machine that comes and it refluffs your turf and it drops more of those little black beads on it or whatever. And so most people get their turf fluffed every year. Um, so the, we have a turf fluffer that comes. I, th I thought the verb was floof. Whatever. Floof. But yeah. So, so anyway, so I don't, I don't know what kind of turf we're getting. There's tons of research on turf and different types of turf and turf injuries, things like that, because um, so many people are going to it. There are, some, there are some places, interestingly, that are making the switch back to grass. Iowa State still plays on grass. So there's a few places that still play. Well, there's a lot of Minnesota Iowa jokes that are going to come back <laughs> after. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So it's it's interesting. It it definitely um, those things are are things that we take into consideration when athletes travel and things like that. What the shoe surfaces, what they're what they're going to wear, things like that. Something Another like question from online: Can yeah. genetic sequencing analysis? Oh as my a gosh, way above my pay grade. You can, you can always fake it. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Can genetic sequencing analysis as a predictor for IA for people, and so correct, uh, is a, and so a corrective action can be taken, say, for athletes? Oh dear. Yes. Something can genetic sequencing analysis as a predictor for IA? IA, which stands for the state of Iowa for me. I don't know for people. <laughs> Artificial. I don't know what IA is. Inflammatory arthritis Plays, for people, yes, so corrective arthritis. action can be taken, say, for athletes. It should be OA. Okay. okay. Can, genetic sequencing, oh, uh, can genetic sequencing analysis as a predictor for OA for people, and so corrective actions can be taken for, say, athletes? It's a very good question. I don't know. That's, that's, like, yeah. that's like ethics being ahead of bioethics kind of yeah. being ahead of where technology is. Yeah, I don't, that's a great question. I, I think Raj is following up on what you were saying about parents are such a good Oh, how you pick your parents, yeah. yeah. Well, the thing, the thing that I always think about is, um, you know, it's kind of natural selection. So people who have pain in their knees, things like that, they probably discontinue sport activity. And so by the time, those people have fallen out by natural selection. So by the time they get to the college level, those people that may have a, a tendency to OA or arthritic changes or tears in their ACL, things like that, a lot of those people have already self-selected to discontinue that activity. Very good. Yes? I was just going to comment on this because I keep track of the genetic aspects. Oh, please share. There's not enough, not enough information to do a genetic test to determine whether you're going to get any disease or any complex So there's not enough information yet to, to determine whether you're going to get a disease of that nature yet? Right. Okay. I don't, that makes thank sense. You. Thank you for thank you for that. Appreciate it. Anything else? You didn't tell me these people are going to be this smart. <laughs> I didn't know. This is great. This has been really fun. I this is yes. this is delightful. I've had a really good time. This You've asked great questions. Um, shared your experience, which I appreciate. I hope I didn't put anybody yep. to sleep. It's yeah. always an affirmative, appreciative audience. It's yeah, great stuff. it's great. It's been a lot of fun. I'll tell Dan. I'll tell Dan that like you guys aren't going to eat them up, spit them out, or anything like that. No. no. One of my colleagues is going to come later this semester. He had some scheduling issues, so he's going to talk a little bit more, probably about the basic science behind OA. And ideally, we wanted to set it up so he would speak first, then I would follow it up. But we just logistically couldn't figure out our schedules. So that's Dan Cobian, and he'll be here May 11th. May 11th. So he'll talk more about OA and science behind it and things like that and talk a little bit more probably about the biomechanics and loading. That's kind of his area of expertise. Great. Yeah. Next week we'll see you back for molecular biology of coronaviruses. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.